Hello everyone and um, welcome to the last session. Um, so in this session we have four research presentations. Each will be 15 minutes followed by five minutes for questions. So first up we're going to have Anna Henry. Um, are you here Anna? Uh, yeah I'm here. Great. So Anna Henry is from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Uh, she's a research economist and her research can be split into two strands. So she focuses on the UK tax and benefit system and inequality. And the other is on later life um, economic outcomes and well-being. And Anna is going to be presenting today on um, how do those already out of employment fare when the state pension age rises? So pass over to Anna. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so yeah, uh, good afternoon everyone. I'm going to be presenting some research that my colleagues and I have been doing at the IFS, looking at the increase in state pension age for women and how it affects their outcomes. So let's jump right into it. So over the past decade or so, the state pension age for women has gradually increased from 60 to 66. Over the same time, men's state pension age has increased from 65 to 66 and further changes are legislated to increase both men and women's state pension age to 67 and then to 68. What's important to take from this is that this policy of increasing state pension age is not only historically relevant but it continues to be relevant in the future and so it's important for us to understand how outcomes really evolve around this time. So what does happen when you reach a state pension age? So let's take the example of women who have turned 60 but have not reached the state pension age as a result of the state pension age increasing. Well now, these women can no longer receive a state pension, but more than that, they face the working age tax and benefit system for longer, which is less generous. Previous work shows that the, an increase in the state pension age leads to a fall in incomes and an increase in income poverty. So we know that living standards are determined by a lot of different things, not just income. And so it's natural to ask really, how do these shocks to income affect expenditure and well-being, which are other measures of the way in which we can imagine living standards? We focus on women who've left employment before 16. I'm going to show you that this is a group of people who don't delay retirement as a result of the reform. But this is a really interesting group of people to focus on for two reasons. One, because they don't change their employment, we can really disentangle the effect of the increase in state pension age on their expenditure and well-being without this change in employment. In addition to this, we're going to hypothesize that this group might, fight, might face a little bit more difficulty during this time because they don't have this employment income as a way of mitigating the loss in state pension income. So just as a background for the policy, this is how the reform took place. Before, all women had the same state pension age of 60 years old. In 1995, it was legislated to increase the state pension age to 65 for women and then increase it to 66, and that legislation came into force in 2007. Now, you see this sawtooth pattern, and this comes as a result of the fact that women were given a state pension date to retire on, and this was determined by your month of birth. So women who were born later in the month had a slightly shorter state pension age. They, were, they could retire a few days earlier. Now, in 2011, new legislation sped up the increase, which is why you see a slight increase in the rate. And now all women have a state pension age of 66. The data we're using is the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. It's a survey that's taken every two years and has been running since 2002. It has really rich data on incomes, wealth, work, health and other demographics, and it's a representative sample of England's 50 plus population. In particular, we're going to be looking at data from 2008 to 2019, 
Well, at the start of this period, state pension age was 60, and by the end, it was just over 65. In particular, we're going to be looking at women aged 58 to 65. So we look at a whole range of different outcomes, but in the interest of time, uh, we're going to stick to a handful of them. First, we're going to look at employment and income, and then we're going to move on to expenditure. So ELSA contains a lot of questions on household expenditure on a range of non-durable goods and services. And this includes food in home, food out of home, leisure, gas and electricity and clothing. For this age group of 55 to 70, this makes up around 40% of total spending, with the main missing components being transport, rent, packaged holidays, and furniture and other equipment. We then go on to look at well-being, and in particular, I'm going to show you results for life satisfaction. Now, this is a score between 0 and 10, which measures how satisfied a person felt the previous day, with 0 being the lowest and 10 being the most satisfied. OK, so in terms of methodology, we're going to use a difference in difference method, which exploits the fact that people born after April 1950 have a gradually higher state pension age. Now, this can be modelled using a basic two-way fixed effects model, where Y is the outcome. Beta is the parameter that we're interested in. Overstate pension age is a dummy for if you've been if you're over or below the state pension age, and it's an interaction between your age and the time. And from those, you can work out with policy if you're over or below. And we're also going to control for other characteristics, including education, region, marital status, and some characteristics of your partner. Now. In recent years, there's been some discourse about using two-way fixed effects models, especially when there is staggered treatment. Two-way fixed effects may lead to a biased estimate. So we are implementing the BJS imputation method in order to get our results. The key assumption here is that we have common trends. So without reforms, outcomes for 59-year-olds would have changed in the same way as they do for 60-plus-year-olds. Uh, the question we want to look into is the effect of being over state pension age on income, household expenditure and well-being, focusing mostly on those not in paid work at age 58. So now I'm going to prove something that I said earlier, which is those who are out of work at 58 typically don't go back into employment as a result of the state pension age increasing. So what I'm showing you here are the it is the change in percentage point difference in the probability of employment between individuals above the state pension age compared to those below the state pension age. So if we're looking at our entire sample of women between 58 and 65, we see that there's people who are above the state pension age are 11 percentage points less likely to be in employment. When we restrict this to those who are in work at 58, we see that the fall in employment is slightly larger. But when we look at those who are out of work at 58, we don't really see any significant effects. What we can take from this is being above or below the state pension age doesn't really determine whether you're in employment. And so a change in policy which increases the state pension age also shouldn't change whether you're in employment. And so we're back to this idea that this group of people who are out of work at 58 may face some particular difficulty around this time because they don't have this employment income coming in to help them out when they lose state pension income. Now, to start telling you the story of what's really happening around this time, we can first start by looking at how incomes change for different age groups over 2008 to 2018. So if you remember in 2008, state pension age was 60, by 2018, state pension age was just over 65. So this group that we're seeing of 59 year olds in the red line, they're always below the state pension age over this time, and 66 year olds are always above the state pension age over this time. And you can see that on average, 66 year olds who are above the state pension age, their average income is higher. 
But now what happens when we start adding in age groups that did see a change in their state pension age? So let's start with six-year-olds. Six-year-olds in 2010 were all above state pension age. You can see their incomes are very similar to that of 66-year-olds who are also above the state pension age. Between 2010 and 2012 is when the state pension age increased from 60 up to 61. And you can see that co the cohorts of 60-year-olds in 2012, who are now below the state pension age, have on average a lower income. If we look at 61-year-olds, again, we see this very similar trend of cohorts of 61-year-olds who are above state pension age having a higher average income than cohorts who are below. And again, for 62, 63, and 64, we can see that there is this change in income that's happening as you go from being above to below the state pension age. But what now if we look at expenditure? We can plot this on the same scale. And what we see is very little change. We're not seeing this huge shock to expenditure for a huge change in expenditure for those above versus below the state pension age. And now this really sets the scene for the results that I'm going to go on to show you. So first we can look at income. So this is exactly what I was showing you in that first set of graphs. We can see that for those, for the entire sample, when they're above the state pension age, their average weekly income is around £48 higher than those below. For those who are in work at 58, the change is slightly smaller, and for those who are out of work at 58, it's slightly bigger. And this can come down to this employment effect we were talking about. Those who are in work at 58 are able to go back and about able to continue employment and able to use employment income as a form of mitigating the loss of state pension income that they're not getting. So how another way of interpreting these results is a policy which increases state pension age and delays state pension age for people means that those who stay below the state pension age are receiving this negative income shock. If we look in terms of persistence, we see that even many quarters after the state pension age, you see this persistence in difference in income. And so this is not a temporary shock. This is more of a permanent change in your income. When you look at income, including your partner's income, we see a very similar story. Again, we do still see this income shock where for the entire sample, you're seeing around a £44 increase in uh, income including your partner when you're above the state pension age. And this is again slightly bigger for those who are out of work at 58. So taking all of this together, we're seeing, generally speaking, these women are facing a very large income shock around this time. So how does this feed into expenditure? Well, as you remember in the graph, there is not really much going on in terms of expenditure. This is really interesting to see. We see that in terms of magnitude, and also in terms of statistical significance, there are very little effects. So we're seeing this huge change in income, but expenditure is not really changing very much. Again, when we look at how persistent this is, it's very similar to this income story. Again, not really much going on in terms of changes in expenditure, even many quarters after you uh, reach your state pension age. Two more minutes. Thank you. Um, so there are a couple of reasons why this might be the case. So one reason might be that people may have already adjusted their consumption when they found out when their state pension age was going to be and they've exhibited some sort of consumption smoothing and so we don't see any big changes around state pension age itself. Another reason might be an income shock may not be changing expenditure decisions at its margin. You might be you might imagine that some people have money going into savings and so actually when their income falls, they're actually saving a bit less but not changing their expenditure very much. 
Or you may think that different components of expenditure are going in different directions or maybe not moving. And so overall, we see very little effect. But we can look into this. When you look at the various components, again, there's not much change going on. There's some little change in gas and electricity, but relative to its mean, it's very small. So it's not so much there aren't many changes going on. There aren't changes that are counteracting each other. It's in general expenditure is not changing very much. Of course, we're only looking at the core consumptions, and it might be that expenditure and other components are changing. But it's maybe a relief to see that these very essential items aren't really changing very much when income is getting a shock. When we look at well-being and life satisfaction, we see slight improvements in life satisfaction score when you're above the state pension age. Now, this is generally quite small. Mean is 7.2 for the score, and the increase in the score is around 0.3 for the entire sample. But we are seeing it a change in the right direction here. And so we can take from this that being above the state pension age may improve your life satisfaction and well-being. Tying all of this together, when the state pension age increases for women who are already out of the workforce and under the state pension age, they're getting a huge income shock. But the household expenditure seems to be largely unresponsive to this, and it doesn't seem to be changing within the components of expenditure either. In terms of well-being, it shows signs of potential decline for those who are under the state pension age. And so we have this picture of people who are out of work at 58 who may have a very large income shock, but maybe their living standards in other measures aren't changing too much. Thank you. I'll, I'm happy to take any questions.